Now, what I'd like to do is to show you, and I'll show you more explicitly with a much larger reed in a moment, we'll look at the pedal ones. But say, for example, I take one of these chaps out. We'll take this one out. So that is the four-foot reed, and it's bottom C sharp, bottom D. So... That's a top So if I take that out... Off, when I say off, I'm taking the resonator off the shallot. And that's the sound the tongue makes on its own, without the, without the resonator. And then I can take that little tongue out... This is why I put it all out of tune. <laughs> now, if you notice, the pipe I've just removed, or you may not have seen, has no slot on it to regulate it. Now, some do in this organ and some don't. But the way some of the continental makers like to produce their reeds is to ensure that nobody fiddles with them. <laughs> so they set the volume right at the start in a way that most people wouldn't want to fiddle around with. And the way they do it as an English builder would do it, is the design of the shallot, and I'll show you different designs in a moment. That is referred to as the shallot. On the tongue, on the shallot, sits the tongue. Do you see? And I'm going to push that chap down, which is a spring. And I expect I'll catch something like this. And if I move the spring further up, you see? Now, that's as simple as it comes. They're all pushed in to this mahogany block. And it's immensely important that that engineering is good. So this always remains tight. Whether it's 50 or 100 years old, whether the humidity is really damp or it's very dry, it has to remain tight because if it doesn't, and this tongue comes loose, the note's gone and finished. And that's an expensive call to the organ team. So, the way you would increase or just decrease the volume are several ways. A way an English builder might do it on this particular block, referred to as a block, bottom D of the clarion, they would probably curve the tongue a little more if they wanted a little louder. They would increase that curve, which is very, very easy to do. And when you increase the curve, it is very, very important. All you have to do is to hold this little chap, and I know you can't see, but I can see the gap that runs along from the tongue to the end if I hold it up to the light. And the key, the key um, um, a question to making this tongue speak nicely is to make sure that when you're looking up to the light and you press with your finger at the far end, the light rolls up the shallot evenly and there is no lump so that the, that tongue closes very slowly all the way up without any gaps right to the top, under its own, uh, only if you press it at the end. Of course it will if you press it all the way along, but I'm talking about at the very end. Now, the way the Europeans like to make sure their reeds are un, in, in, fiddled with um, by so-called experts, <laughs> they put cardboard, it's very special cardboard, it's very hard, it's very good quality, moths don't like it, etc. Uh, they put that, they roll it up, and they, they, they make the, the little hole here, which allows the wind from the shallot to go through and into that resonator, they can make it smaller. And that's the one way they can do to make that stop now or softer. And it, it is a work of art to get that all right, it's fine, anyone can do it for one pipe. But I watched Moon's um, Peterson voice this organ when it was put in. And I mean, he would spend maybe two days on this one stop, and out of that time he's, he's voiced 60 pipes. And when we got to the 32, I remember, because they were working here and not in Denmark, and the 32 was, I don't think it had been originally planned for, it was put in right at the last minute. He had to voice the 32 over here, and he didn't know what to use as tools to voice the 32, because you have to curve the tongue. And I'll show you in a minute, the tongue is an awful lot larger than this one. So there is four foot bottom C. What I'm going to do is now put it back in, and it'll be violently flat, and I'm going to ask Norma if she'd be so kind as to hold the C above or the, the, for me. Actually, I don't need that, Norma, because I can do it from the red buttons. And I'll tune that back up to the, to the, the appropriate note. Right, I'll do that now. Now, if anybody wishes to see, it's always important, if you've taken the, a reed pipe, particularly, or a flue, 
when you put it back in, to put it in on what is so-called wind, and that makes certain that no other things go down that tip hole, dust, etc. I put that in. Right, now I'll put the resonator back in. And I've got to find the C. No, it's not the D. can tune that fairly easily from there. If that is a D, I think it is. Oh, it's the wrong one. And that's bottom D of the, of the clarion. Now, may I show you that same thing on the much larger reeds at the bottom end? Because they're a little easier to see. If you see... Uh, 32, 16, and 8, no forefoot. The 32 is half length. And bottom C, he said, oh, could you draw out the 32, Norma, please? Now that is this chap here. I'm not going to fiddle around with it because I can't get to it terribly easy. Norma, could you now draw on the 16? Which is this one. And now the 8, which will be this one. And the eight-foot trumpet. And just to show you that I'm not um, 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 uh, playing around with it. There's the trumpet. So we'll just take that little chap out. Could you be kind enough to hold that for me, Norma? That same note, bottom C. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm holding it, so forgive me. Don't worry. Don't worry. That's all right, don't worry. That's fine. Thank you, Norma. That's wonderful. So I can take this little chap out. And then at least you can see that a little more clearly. Here is the tongue, the bottom C of the eight-foot trumpet. Now, you'll notice that the tongue is thicker than the forefoot. And it needs to be, of course. The lower the tongue, the, 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 the deeper the note, the thicker the tongue will be. And I will suck that one as well, just to try and... and you remember the other one sounded like a bumblebee. The shallot is a little high. Too. The shallot is much larger. Yes, that's right. So, and all it is is this. And this makes people go mad, doesn't it? I mean, people write music for this. And here it is. <laughs> so there we are. That that is bottom C. And I'll do the same as I did on the four, and that is to put it back in on wind. But this time I'm going to have to ask Norma. Norma, would you be very kind and with your feet, could you play bottom C? <clears throat> uh, no, oh, sorry, so sorry. Norma, with your foot on the pedal board, the lowest C. <laughs> this is very good. This is a good start. Where's her husband? <laughs> Let me show you. Sorry, I can show you a little yeah. without bending it too far. Okay, it's yeah. fairly open. Oh, it's quite right. But I'll... I'll, I'll yeah. Yes, is, is that enough for you? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll put that in. <laughs> and could you add the 16, Norma? And play that same note? Thank you. And could you add to that the 32 and hold the same note? Thank you. Okay, thank you. There is your chorus of, of reeds. One row of eights, another row behind it of sixteens, and a row at the very back of thirty twos. That's the family of, of, of reeds in this order. Now, if we go round the front again, having shown you this, may I show you round the, the desk at the front where I've got those books open. May I just show you a couple of pictures there? So that is, and this, we're talking not about Westminster Cathedral, whose bombard is on, say, 30 inches of wind, which is a massive, great high pressure. You're talking here about 5 inches or 6 inches of wind for a really, a, a, a 32 foot, literally, the tube will go up to halfway up, well, most of the way up to the church there. So you're talking about a very large pipe, not working on very large pressures but produce this fantastic, and of course, it's interesting that it is typically French. I mean, the further north you go in Europe, the more delicate and the more 
nascent, you like, the reeds become. I'm being, I'm generalising, of course there are exceptions, but it's quite, and the, the further south you go, the, 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 the more open the shallots are, and I think it's rather like our music and, 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 and the way our language is, the, the, the much more open, um, somehow or other, we don't, have, and in England, where we are suffering still from having an empire a hundred years ago and being horribly confident, so confident that we blow our reeds, which are tubers, on the highest pressures imaginable, but make this slot so tiny that nothing will vibrate over it. It's an interesting thing. You just go over to France and everything's free and it is open. Would you like to ask me any questions so far? I'm just wondering, Please do. With, um, when, you, when you adjust the top of a, a reed pipe, yes. what, what are you doing? Because it right. all seems to I was, happen this episode. I was just about to come to that. So, we go on from the, the, the bottom of the reed to the resonator. And the resonator, they sometimes call them tubes or whatever they call them. But those resonators have to be made to the right lengths. Yes? I won't explain, because I probably can't straight off my pack, um, exactly which length it is for which note. But they have to be mathematically organized so they are the right length. If you, they don't, they're not the right length, the note will never be stable, it will never stay in tune, indeed it might fly off altogether. But before you get to that point, here is the interesting point. And the interesting point is, you can make those resonators ever so slightly too long, just a, a millimeter too long, and tune it to the note, and the note is very smooth, and produces an O of vowel sound. If you chop the resonator down till it's some, somewhere else, just ever so slightly, the vowel sound changes to, a, to an O. If you, cha if you chop it down a little further, slicing it down just by taking a knife around the top and just letting a little bit of lead fall on the floor, you can change that O to an A. And then it starts to become ugly. And then it becomes too short. And the easy way of dealing with this, because it's such a fearful operation, you have to do it at the right temperature, at the right pressure, at the right pitch, because those three things govern that length of that pipe. Also in flue pipes, and I'll come back to that. But the easy, nice easy way was to take, make the resonator a little bit too long and to put a slot in the top. Now if you open that slot, slot you start to make the vowel sound of a trumpet a little more like an A. If you close it, it becomes a little more of an ooh, if you tune it. But each time you move the slot at the top, you have to adjust the tuning spring at the base. So, if you move the, you want it to be a smoother sound, you would close the top down a tiny bit, and you would sharpen, therefore allowing less of the tongue to vibrate, only slightly, we're only talking about tiny, tiny measurements, and we'd sharpen at the tongue, and therefore you'd suddenly find the thing became much smoother. So smooth. And indeed, some builders excel at how smooth they could make reeds. Other builders excel at making them very open. But that tiny, and that, of course, that finishing is very important because when you are voicing an organ of this size, you cannot start voicing it easily unless you've got a level temperature because the temperature makes all the difference because the pitch will be different. And I think you all know the pitch goes up and down with temperature. And indeed, the, the whistles of an organ all move. The reeds stay roughly where they are, but the reeds, because there are so few of them, always have to be tuned up to meet the, the whistles. And what happens when they go to France to perhaps record a marvellous instrument? They wait for the winter. So the reeds are made a little flatter, so the organs sound brighter and more exciting. And many people don't realise that, but the people who do know who are very good at it, they try to do that. And likewise, the opposite way round, if you should want the opposite way round. But <coughs> temperature is the key, and an even temperature. Well, it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's zero or 100 degrees, but it must stay the same, at the same wind pressure, and at the same pitch. So you're tuning here in Kingston Parish Church, you're voicing the whole organ from scratch. You would say, what is the average temperature? You'd ask the church authorities, can we have a little record? What are we doing? And they'll say, well... Let's say in the summer months it's 65. We're in the summer months, we're tuning at 65. What is the pitch? It's A at 440, it'll be British standard unless there's some other special um, requirement. So you knew the two very important factors with creating these reeds and making them sound well. And that's 
you've got the temperature under control, and if it's going down below 60, you stop voicing and you turn the heating on so that it come, just comes gently back to 65. If it gets too hot, you have to open the doors. But you must try and keep it at the same temperature whilst you're voicing. Then the last most important factor of all, of course, is the pressure at which you're blowing that freeze. And you have to know what that pressure is. As long as you do, and you have it regularly, and it's, it's, it's brought to the, the, the pipes efficiently by a good set of bellows, as this has, then you're fine. But you need to know that. And when you know the pressure, you can start to say, what sort of sound do I want? Because I know what sort of thickness of tongue I will need at bottom C, for example, of an eight-foot trumpet. I'll know roughly what sort of thickness I will require, only by experience, by feel indeed. The same applies when you're building this organ. If you notice, all the pipes, they're flat, they're at the top. They've got no slots in them. Well, some of them actually do. Have. They're hidden around the back, so you can't, I won't talk about those. But, <laughs> but there are some. But basically, they are cut with a knife to length, which means that they should stay in tune. The only thing that will put them out of tune is dust. However, that's in, that's in the theory and that's in the books. It doesn't always work like that. Well, it does work like that, but dust gets in peculiar places. You get a fly in one pipe, you get some dust in another, and so on. However, all of these pipes have been cut down with a knife till they're dead in tune. So if they were all washed and cleaned and put back on the same wind pressure at the same temperature, they'll be in tune. You won't even have to touch them. And that is called cone tuning. Now, in order to tune those pipes, and this is bad, because in a way you shouldn't have to do it, you have special tools which are called tuning brasses, and they are cones. I should have brought one with me. I'm so sorry I didn't. And you can bell the top of the pipe out ever so slightly if you want it to be sharper. Or you can cone it inward so the pipe is busy. And you'll see most pipes in this orbit will be coned in. If you look at the bottoms of the gamble, on the right-hand side, behind the swell shutters, the top of them, they look just as if they're coned in ever so slightly. You can see them shining on the four-foot principle in the positive as well. The great big 16s will have slots on the back because you, they're not practical to cone tune. But tuning and voicing are very, very important actions to take place when you know your parameters of pressure, of, of, of wind, and of temperature, and of pitch.